Let's do our first example. Uh, decided, actually throughout this entire lecture series and our book, we are going to follow two different buildings. Uh, I'm going to give you as much information as we need right now to do this part of the problem, this example that I want to do, but you're on an as needed, uh, as need to know basis. <laughs> Eventually you'll see the whole building and we actually laid out a five-story steel office building in San Luis Obispo. We've laid out a um, concrete sheer wall building in Los Angeles, five stories also. The Los Angeles site has very high geotechnical values. The San Luis Obispo site has much smaller geotechnical values. Two buildings are very different in the way they're going to respond to earthquakes. So there are two great examples to go through. You know, they're five stories, so they're fairly easy to do, but <clears throat> more importantly, most of your buildings will probably be in this range. Most buildings are in this height range. Um, every once in a while, we have really tall buildings, but drive around any city and you will see most of the buildings in any normal city except Chicago, New York, Los Angeles are in this range of heights. So that your career is probably going to be made up of a lot of five-story buildings. So we, we wanted to pick something that would be useful to you Cal Poly people. And so we did one right in your hometown. Okay. Special steel moment frames. The building data for special steel moment frames, the R factor is eight. In this, this is, uh, we have this as a residential building. Uh, sorry, steel office building. The concrete building is a uh, residential uh, building with some storage. So this is an office building, risk category two, which most of your buildings will be risk category two is a regular structure, which means it has no vertical or horizontal irregularities as defined by ASC 7. <clears throat> One Grand Avenue in San Luis Obispo has a site latitude of 35.29607 and a site longitude of negative 120.65306. You can look it up. This building has a total weight of 15,033 kips you may be asking why we have an odd number, but we started out with round numbers for a load criteria sheet, a pretty much round numbers for the diaphragm dimensions, the building plan dimensions. But it's funny how even you take normal round numbers and you still get odd numbers when you come out with some of the calculations. But this is a realistic example. This is very likely a, a real steel office building. We are assuming right now, we'll actually prove this later, that the calculated dynamic fundamental period, first mode period, is 1.45 seconds. So from the geotechnical engineer, we get ground data. We can actually go to the USGS website and get the same information. Uh, the geotechnical engineer would have to tell us that this was class, site class D soil, stiff soil. That is the default factor if you don't know, so I mean, if, they, if they don't tell you. We get that at this site the S sub S factor, short period, 1.124 G. S1, the one second factor, is 0.429 G. Okay, this is our building. We have a little bit lighter roof like I said, eventually I'll show you the load criteria and the, and the plate area that came up with this. 2505 kips and all the floors are 3,132 kips. The floor height, the first floor height is 16 feet and all the remaining floor heights are 13 feet. Early round numbers and fairly realistic numbers for a steel office building. The total height of the building is 68 feet. So I am asking you, and you will have a homework assignment that's very similar to this, where I ask you, figure out what the site seismic design category is for this, this building. What is the maximum period that we are allowed to use to calculate the base shear? Even though the website will print an SDS and an SD1 value, I want you to calculate it. We're going to calculate it. 
We will then calculate the CS value or the CS factor, which is the coefficient multiplied by that gets multiplied by the building weight to get the base share, and then we will calculate the base share itself. Part A, seismic design category. I know I'm leaving the picture, but again, that's okay. If you refer to ASCE 7 section 11.6 for this, um, there's a lot in there about seismic design category. Um, but for all practical purposes, West Coast buildings, uh, we're going, this will be the situation that you have. You, you are looking at the S1 value that you got from the geotechnical report or the USGS site. We have a risk category two building, therefore with, um, with that combination, according to section 11.6, when S1 is less than 0.75, we have a, a seismic design category of D. If this number, S1, were greater than 0.75, we would have a seismic design category E, which has some implications. Um, we'll get to that actually in the next example. So, seismic design category D. There are restrictions, there, I mean, there are qualifications when you have a seismic design category D, but nothing really unusual. This is, this is the range we expect. When you get into E, you need to take a harder look at the things that the code will not allow. Calculate the maximum usable building period. ASCE 7, section 12.8.2. Remember, we had calculated a dynamic period of 1.45. We haven't done that yet, but we will actually use a method to, to estimate that. But just assume it's happened already. The maximum building period that we are allowed to use in base year calculations is the CU factor multiplied by T sub A. This used to be called the method A period, so that A is just hung around, I think. So T sub A is equal to C sub T factor times the height of the building in feet with an exponent of the X factor. ASCE 7, imagine that there's a 7 in there. Table 12.2-1 for steel special moment frames tells us the C sub T factor is 0 0.028, the X factor is 0 0.8. Therefore, we calculate an A period, fundamental period, of 0 0.82 seconds. If we go to ASC 7 table 12.8-1, it lists different values of CU, but you'll notice that it is always conservative to use a CU value of 1.4, and that's almost always what you will have anyway. So, you get to increase the old method A period by 40% as the absolute maximum that you are allowed to use in base shear calculations. But then again, you have to prove that you have that period. So that's, we'll get to that later. The maximum period, therefore, is 1.4 times 0.82. The maximum period we can use for base shear calculations is 1.15 seconds. We have to show, I mean, that, that's less than the 1.45. Part C, calculate the SDS and SD1 values. Now that USGS will print those already for you, but you've got to be careful. There are times when those printed values will be higher for conservative, and you may be able to use lower values so of the SDS factor. So, that's why I want you calculating these things. Well, we have a site class D, geotechnical report or USGS said that we have an S of S of 1.124 and an S1 of 0 0.429. Therefore, table 11.4-1, I didn't write all the site classes, I just wrote site class D. For S sub S of 1, that table says S sub A is 1.1. For S sub S greater than or equal to 1.25, the S sub A factor is 1. We interpolate between the two for our S sub S factor of 
and the interpolated value is 1.05. So F sub A for us is 1.05. If we do the same thing in table 11.4-2 for the F sub V factor. This is the constant uh, velocity range of the spectrum. For site class D, for an S1 value of 0.4, the F sub V factor is 1.6. For an S1 value greater than or equal to 0.5, the F sub V factor is 1.5. We have an S1 factor of 0.429, so we interpolate between these two numbers and get 1.157. So we have the F sub A factor and the F sub V factor. We come over here to calculate SMS, which is equal to FA times SS. FA we calculated as 1.05. SS we got from the geotechnical report or the web page, multiply those, SMS is 1.18. We're going to draw the response spectrum and these things will become clear of what they actually are. SM1 at the one second range is the, this was the constant acceleration factor in the response spectrum, this is the constant velocity factor times S1, F sub V of 1.57 multiplied by the S1 value that we were given 0.429 equals 0.67. So we have SMS and SM1. SDS and SD1 are just two-thirds of those values. So SDS is two-thirds, SMS two-thirds of 1.18 is 0.79. This is what we really need to know to build that response spectrum. SD1 is two-thirds of SM1. Two-thirds of 0.67 is 0.45. Now we can build the response spectrum. Okay, now that we have the geotechnical parameters figured out, we can go and actually create the response spectrum. I'm going to say it again, I said before, uh, you may think, you may come, have come into this class thinking you would only use a response spectrum to understand <clears throat> dynamic modal analysis, but I don't want you to think that way in this class. We're, it's just as much a part of the equivalent lateral force procedure as, as it is for dynamic analysis. So this is the generic code given. You know, if, we, if the geotechnical engineer didn't give us uh, a response spectrum, which I think there is less and less common now because we can build our own and they give us all the values to do it, uh, this is what we start with. This is our site. So we take that and we plug in our numbers. SDS is 0.79. We calculated SD1 of 0.45. That corresponds, SD1 corresponds to the one second period. Um, SDS is the constant acceleration portion of the response spectrum. <clears throat> I like to also put in the peak ground acceleration. Peak ground acceleration, this used to be important to us back when ZIC over RW was our base shear uh, equation. The Z stood for the peak ground acceleration. So for those of us old guys, um, this still means something. Maybe it's just sentimental, but I like to know what the ground is doing. The ground is the zero period, absolutely zero period. By the way, this, this T sub naught, whatever it is, it's completely irrelevant. I don't care if you calculate it or not. Nobody really in their right mind would ever design down the back side of a response spectrum. You will not do that in my class. Um, this you know, realistically just gets lopped off all the way to zero. So any period you have less than the short period T sub S, you will use the constant acceleration value. But it is, I do want you to draw it down, I do want you to draw it down to the peak ground acceleration because that is what the ground is doing. If it, if there was a block in the ground and it was going through this earthquake, that's its acceleration. The response spectra is measuring the fact that a building has actually got an additional response beyond what the ground is doing. It's actually whipping back and forth depending on how 
call it is, there will be multiple modes that are acting independently. We'll get into all that. But, but right now, our sight response spectrum looks like this. The short period is the SD1 divided by SDS value, and that is 0.57. So, so that's how I want you to set this up. This is actually the C sub S plot graph. It is the response spectrum, but what makes it the C sub S value is that we divide by R and multiply by the importance factor. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The importance factor is gonna be one throughout this course. I'm not gonna do anything other than that. It would be very easy to do it. I may give you a homework assignment that has I or greater than one, but it's just easier right now to think of it as one. So really, I'd like you to think of this as the response spectrum divided by the response modification factor, or what we used to call the ductility factor. This actually gives you the base shear coefficient. And this is the incredibly important diagram, and this is what I want you to draw in your homework assignment. I want to see this, and then I want to see it divided by Whatever R factor I've given you, whatever the building seismic system is and the corresponding redundancy factor, you divide that spectrum by that R factor, gives you everything you need to know about the design. So, the constant acceleration, 0 0.098. This part of the equation in the what's called the constant velocity region. The C sub S factor is SD1 divided by T divided by R and multiplied by I if it were something other than one. These are the same as they were over here. But now I want you to plot our fundamental period, our first mode period. First mode period that we calculated the maximum that we could use, not the dynamic period. The dynamic period was 1.45. This is the maximum period allowed by code to calculate the base shear. So, at 1.15 seconds, we intercept this equation, and this equation gives us this value, 0.049. Now, you are probably used to just going to equation 12.8-2, calculating what that was, 0.098, then going to 12.8-3, and the code says, C sub S need not be taken greater than or need not exceed SD1 over T divided by R over I. That's just the same as this. That's just this curve. You know, hopefully that by realizing and drawing this curve and realizing where you intercept this, there was never any point to calculate this. If you're just plugging in numbers and plugging in equations, then you calculate this, then you calculate this, and you say, oh wow, this is less than this. I'll use this. Okay, that's one way to do it. The better way, in my opinion, the way that demonstrates that you understand what we're doing is to draw this graph, intercept at that period. If you intercept this part of the curve, that's the equation you're using. If you intercept the curve here, this is what you're using for CS. So we will have a base shear coefficient for this five-story steel moment frame building in San Luis Obispo of 0 0.049. 0 0.049 times the weight of the building. To be anatomically correct, we need to also check the absolute minimum values. Like I said, these will rarely govern, and they particularly rarely, oh, they never govern for me because I design concrete buildings. But, um, 0 0.044 SDSIE but greater than or equal to 0 0.01 is equation 12.8-5. That gives a, a value of 0 0.035. That's less than what we actually calculated. We will be required to use what we calculated, the 0 0.049. There is a second equation that we have to check sometimes, that sometimes being when our S1 value is 
greater than 0 0.6 G. <coughs> we um, are less than that in this particular example. We're not going to be less than that in the next example. Uh, so it's not necessary that we check equation 12.8-6 this time. It will be next time. So, for the five-story steel office building in San Luis Obispo with relatively low geometric, geometric, geotechnical parameters, the design base here, one coefficient now, that's progress, we used to have so many, now we have one. When 049 times the weight of the building, the 15,033 kips, the design base here that we will use is 737 kips. Now I'm going to do one more example. I'm going to do a five-story, much heavier concrete building using shear walls with much higher geotechnical parameters. And we're going to run through what I just did here for that concrete building. And um, you will be prepared, have all the information you need to do the first homework assignment that I'm going to ask you to do. Okay? Any questions? None? Okay. Okay. Example number two. And as I told you in the last example, through this entire lecture series, through the book, we are following two of our favorite buildings, a five-story steel moment frame building in San Luis Obispo and a five-story post-tension concrete, though the post-tensioning won't really come up in this, shear wall building. Uh, special shear wall building in Los Angeles. So the Los Angeles site I picked for a very high seismic zone. San Luis Obispo happens to have a fairly low seismic zone. But these two buildings will have very different characteristics, very different ground data. So they're, they're good examples to compare and contrast to. <clears throat> the building data for this building, special concrete, Shear walls in a building frame system which has a redundant or a, a ductility factor of six. Risk category two, it's also a regular structure, so these two things are the same between the two building examples that we're working on. For those of you playing along at home, this is the site latitude and site longitude. You should be able to get the same ground motion data by plugging that in at the USGS survey site that I used. This building has a total weight of 23,162. As much as we tried to keep round numbers, we started off with a real loading criteria, because right now you're on a need-to-know basis about these <laughs> buildings. You will eventually see everything about the load criteria that we developed, uh, what the floor plans look like, how we came up with these weights, what the building dimensions actually are. We'll get there. So, kind of an oddball total building weight, but it's based on a very realistic building. We took one of our buildings, modified it slightly, and this is, uh, is very much in the ballpark of a very real building in Los Angeles. Ground motion data, we are on a stiff site like we usually are, not always, but usually. Site class D, stiff soil. The S sub S value, 2.367, it's a very large number, speaking geotechnically. S1 of 0.831G, that's also a large number. I got those both from using the USGS website that I told you about before, plugging in this latitude and this longitude. The building itself, five elevated levels, a roof, 3922 kips, again, based on real numbers, so when real numbers don't always produce very round uh, numbers, for examples. 4810 for every one of the floors. The first floor is an 18 foot floor in this residential. It's a residential structure, but you're gonna see that a large chunk of it has storage in it. We do that for a reason later when we start doing the diaphragm designs, uh, that will play into it. And also, you're going to learn that a part of that 125 pounds per square foot of storage weight, 25% of it, was required to be included in the weight, the dynamic weight of the structure. So um, that accounts, that, that storage load is also 
in the dead load of the building as it's required to be. So an 18 foot floor first lobby, series of 10 foot six floors after that. Just like we did on the last example, find the size, uh, size of design category for the building. We'll find the period, the first mode period of the building, the SDS and SD1 numbers, the CS value, and the base year. Same thing we did on the last example. Size of design category. This building has a very high S1 value. When the S1 value is greater than 0.75, and, and it's just black and white in the code, you are less than 0.75, you will be a, a seismic design category D if you are in risk category two. If you have an S1 value greater than 0.75, you are simply bumped in a risk category two structure to a seismic design category E. What that means is you will have some restrictions on this building. There are some irregular irregularities that just are not allowed. The big one and the one that gets people in trouble is the extreme torsional irregularity. And <clears throat> while that sounds bad, extreme, it's not that hard, particularly in a concrete shear wall building, to get to that point. I've got some real problems with how this is defined and it seems very unfair because it's not based on total displacements, it's based on relative displacements. Uh, we'll talk about that much later. I feel concrete buildings are fairly, uh, or sure wall buildings get to be penalized a little bit more, but even though they have very tiny actual displacements, technically they can have extreme torsional irregularities even though in the worst case scenario the edge of the building is hardly moving at all. So that, that's my problem but we'll get to that later. There are other restrictions, there are other things you should know about. Go to section 11.6 for that. But I'm here to tell you from a practicing engineer's perspective where you're gonna get in trouble will be right here. And engineers that are not aware that they got kicked to a seismic design category E and that in that category, they cannot have a, an extreme torsional irregularity have gotten caught. Okay, let's calculate the building period for this building. Just like we did for the steel building, go to the same section. C sub T, however, for special concrete shear walls in the building frame system is 0 0.02. I think you guys have seen this, so I'm, I'm gonna go faster through this. The X exponent, X is 0.75 for a concrete building. That gives us what we used to call a method A, that's where the a comes from. Method A period, which is just the A period now, of 0.43 seconds. I do a lot of these buildings. This is right in my wheelhouse. I will tell you that, and I think we'll prove this later, that you can do a whole dynamic analysis and try to come up with a first mode period on a five-story Sherwell building. You most likely will never get yourself, remember what the spectrum looks like, On these buildings, you're going to be here regardless of how you calculate the period and what you use and whether or not you use dynamic analysis and try to get a more accurate number. So it's very unusual, be very difficult to try to go into the constant velocity range of the spectrum. So we're not even going to attempt that right now. You will see later that I believe I got that right. Okay, so just like last time, the SDS and the SD1 values, ASC 7 table 11.4-1 is where we get F sub A from. We are a site class D building. We have very high values, high SS value, high S1 value. But we're off the charts to the right on both of these. There's no interpolation required like there was in the steel building at a lower geo uh, technical seismic site. So, 
we're off the chart. We're greater than an SS value of 1.25 with the very large SS value that we have of 2.3 something. So F sub A is 1.0. Likewise, the next table down, the F sub B, the constant velocity range section, site class D, we're off the charts with that. We're greater than S1. That sends us off the chart to the right. So F sub B is simply 1.5. Makes life a little bit easier. Okay, so SMS is equal to F sub A times SS. Here's where you need to pay attention. And this is cost savings. Our SS value from the USGS is 2.367. This is why I want you, <coughs> excuse me, to calculate these values yourself and not go by what you get printed out from the US Geological Survey website. Section 12.8.1.3 says, and this covers a lot of buildings, a lot of my buildings, probably a lot of your buildings, regular buildings, five stories or less, with a period less than 0.5 seconds. They're talking about concrete shear wall buildings. They might as well just say concrete shear wall buildings, five stories or less. As long as it's regular, in our case it's regular, which means we don't have any irregularities, we can use a value for SS of 1.5 when calculating the CS value. In other words, when calculating the base shear, we are not required to use the 2.367 value for this particular building. Now, the U.S. Geological Survey webpage doesn't know if you have a concrete building or a steel building or a moment frame building, if it's eight stories, if it's three stories if it's a regular building or not. They're going to give you what you get using the largest values. Again, good reason to know what you're doing and not just take things for granted that's printed out for you. Because you're taking this class and you know that you have to calculate these things, you will say, hey, I qualify for the 1.5. And I've told you previously, the code wants to give you a break, take the break. You know, we're on a stiff concrete sheer wall building. This is going to Fall, fail or fall based upon our diaphragm, our connections to our shear walls, our placement of shear walls, our redundancy of how many shear walls, and we never go short on the shear walls. We pretty much in our buildings have to go bay to bay. Our bays are typically on the order of 30 feet, so if we need more than 30 feet, we go to 60 feet. If, if we need more than 60 feet, we go to 90 feet. So that's how it is in our buildings. Uh, so we're, we're never really light on the length of shear walls. This savings really comes out in the foundations for us. There's a tremendous savings by uh, taking the code break that they give you when it comes to the foundations. And we put a tremendous amount of money, concrete, reinforcement in the ground for these earthquakes. Chances are never in my lifetime or your lifetime will these buildings be hit by the earthquake we're designing for, but we're ready just in case. But Code's going to give you a break, take the break. You're probably just going to save a lot of money in the foundations. And your foundations may rock, and rocking a lot of people think is good. <laughs> Actually cuts down on the seismic loads that are getting into the building. So we're going off the, out in the weeds a little bit, but take the break. So even though we're a very high seismic site, geotechnical site, SMS is based upon F sub A, which was 1.0, times the S sub S factor that we're allowed to use, 1.5. So SMS is only 1.5. SM1 is the constant velocity range factor, coefficient, times the spectral value of one second. 1.5 times 0.831. You don't get any break for being a five-story concrete building on the SM1 value, but you are probably not going off that part of the spectrum anyway, so the fact you don't get a break isn't going to make any difference. These were talking, the break came when you got a period of less than 0.5 seconds, which means on the spectrum you're on the maximum acceleration plateau, the constant acceleration plateau. So this becomes kind of an irrelevant number to calculate if you think about it, but we'll calculate it. We get SM1 of 1.25. And finally, SDS is two thirds of SMS. So two thirds of 1.5 is a 1.00, that will be our SDS factor. SD1, which won't come into play as you'll see, but we're going to calculate it anyway. Two thirds SM1, because we want to build a nice response spectrum that looks good. 
two thirds of 1.25 is 0.83. So, ah, there it was. So we've got the SDS and the SD1. We can now build the response vector just like we did last time. Okay, the CS value, the base shear coefficient. We're going to do this right now uh, using the equations, just as if you didn't know that these actually were telling you how to read a response spectrum. I'm going to slip off the screen here. Equation 12.8-2, base shear coefficient equals SDS over R over I. So we have an SDS of 1 divided by 6, 0.167. Code also reads, need not exceed is equation 12.8-3. Base shear coefficient equals SD1 over T divided by the quantity R over I for periods between the short period and the long period, the constant velocity range. 0.83 was what we calculated SD1 as divided by R period of 0.43 divided by R of 6. I don't want to keep saying I is 1, but I is 1 equals 0.321. Wow, it's a very large number. That's greater than 0.167, which is what we got here. While this need not exceed this, we're certainly going to use the one, the 0.167. So use 0.167. That's what people who don't understand that they're working with a response spectrum, you do understand. So I want you again, and I will want you each time to build this response spectrum this time I skipped a step between what I did in the steel building and, and what we're doing here. I went straight to the design response spectrum, the one that's going to create the S, the C sub S, the base shear coefficient. Base shear coefficient is just taking the code response spectrum and dividing by R over I. When I equals 1, we're just dividing the response spectrum in the code by R. So. This 0.167 was really just calculating this line, this constant acceleration range line. We had an SDS of 1, we divided by 6, we get 0.167. So we understand where this came from, this came from right here. Now, code also says need not exceed this value, well SD1 over T over R <coughs> in this period range gives a value with our period of 0.43 of 0.321. So on the response spectrum, what's happening is our period here is 0.43. If we project that up, that's really where we're intercepting this equation, launching up there somewhere. It doesn't make any sense. And people who are, you know, to calculate this number doesn't really make sense. It kind of indicates you're not sure what you're doing. Uh, you know, you got to do what the code says, but still, this is why it's important to understand what we are doing in the response spectrum itself. So we're at a 0.43 range. We know we are less than the, the short period, um, which was SD1 over SDS, and uh, so we know we're in this range. There, there really was never any reason to go look to see if we might be on this part of the spectrum, and if you design as much. As many stiff concrete buildings, you also know that you pretty much are always right here with these shorter, stiffer concrete sure wall buildings. But this is the response spectrum view of that. So we are at 0.43. And what I was saying before is we could do a lot of work to figure out what our dynamic period of this building is. And it will be longer than this. The code is always estimates a shorter, more conservative period. However, we'll probably just bump out to here and we're still going to hit there. So. Um, that, that's the reason it doesn't really benefit you in these short, stiff buildings to do much with the dynamic properties of the building uh, as far as the period and the base shear. Now, the, the force distribution and the fact that you get to go down to 85% of the base shear, which we haven't gotten to yet, I don't want to you know, ruin the surprise for you, but that will be a benefit reason to go dynamic. But it won't be that we can cut down the base shear because we can get ourselves down on this part of the spectrum. Okay. We also have to verify 
because we're dealing with the code that, that we also have a base share coefficient minimum that we have to check. In this particular, uh, well, look at that in a minute. 0 0.044 SDS times IE will give us, you can plug in all those numbers, 0 0.044, substantially less than the 0.167. We probably would have guessed that, but we're in the academic world, so we're going to check that. So we will still be using the 0.167 up at the top of the response spectrum. Building code also says when your S sub 1 value is greater than 0.6, you technically also need to check another CS base shear coefficient equation. This one is 0.5 S1 over R over IE. Now, I want you to start thinking about these things when you see it. When you see S1 values, you know you're out in the constant velocity range of the response spectrum. Okay? When, when you see SDS values, you know you're in the constant acceleration flat part of the response spectrum. So these things should start clicking with you. We're checking an equation because we have a high S1 value, the code's worried, wants another minimum based upon the part of the response spectrum that's going down. So we'll do it. We'll show, even though we're not anywhere near that part of the response spectrum, we will do it. 0.5 S1 over R is 0.069 substantially less than 0.167, and we are still going to be at that maximum top spectrum. <laughs> I mean, once we're there, there's no point in calculating minimums. We're not, we're, we're at maximum. <laughs> we're at the largest value that the code has. So this is just academic. I want you to do it just to show me that you know it's there. I, I do want you to be aware that when you have an S1 value greater than 0.6, there is another minimum equation to check. These things will kick in on your flexible steel buildings. So they're important to know. In this concrete, stiff building, we're right up there at the maximum the code's going to have. Good enough. Move on to the design base shear. Base shear coefficient is what we just calculated. That's 0.167, 16.7% of gravity uh, times the weight of our building. We have a base shear of 3,868, and we're going to take that base shear and we're going to follow that through the rest of this course, really, when we... This will become important as we develop everything else. We'll actually have to check against this in the dynamic analysis part. This force will be used to develop the forces that will become what we need to worry about for the diaphragm design. So this is all critical. I do want you to note, had we not known what we were doing and we were too lazy to calculate our own geotechnical values, except for the SS and the S1, we may have missed the fact that we could use an SS of 1.5 for this particular building. Had we just taken what the U.S. Geological Survey printed for us for um, SDS, we would have, using the SS value of 2.367 and going through all those calculations again, we would have had a base shear of 6,092 kips. 57% higher than the base year that we are allowed to design for, completely compliant with code. So, important. Knowing what you're doing, knowing where all these geotechnical parameters come from, the, the real unintended conservatism comes into place when you get lazy. When you start just letting the computer and the U.S. Geological Survey and everybody just do all your work and you just grab those numbers and plug them in somewhere, you could be designing for a very high base year. Understanding what you're doing, when you get a break out of the code, you know, having to actually do your own calcs every once in a while, as scary as that seems, can really, really benefit you. And this is one where we take that benefit a lot. We, we run into this a lot. nothing left. That's the end of uh, this example. Next lecture is uh, going to be taking the space shear and now we've got to figure out how to distribute it to every level of the building. We will first do that using the equivalent lateral force procedure. Then we will go through that process through the um, modal response vector dynamic analysis. I'll see you at the next lecture.